Welcome, everyone. I'm Damon Wilson. I'm president and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy, and it's great to welcome you all here in person, as well as those who are joining online to a discussion of how geopolitical forces can help promote democratic development in Central Asia. And that's a bit of an unusual statement for the president of NED, because we don't really do geopolitics. We do democracy. We have the privilege to be singularly focused on freedom. And today we're turning that gaze to a region that seeks more freedom, and we'll hear from those who are working to open up more space for their fellow citizens. So I wanna acknowledge our speakers who are here with us. It's an honor to have uh, Yevgeny Jotas back. Um, it's great to have you here, welcome. The director of the Kazakhstan International Bureau for Human Rights, one of the foremost civic activists in Central Asia. And this summer, his organization is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Um, we've got 10 years on you, but you are, represent the oldest continuously operating NGO in the entire Eurasian region. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, joined by Timur Karpov. Tim Timur, it's great to have you here in Washington. The founder of 139, Documentary Center in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, dynamic civic activist who uses art to push the boundaries of public discourse. And Dr. Sebast Sebastian Peruz, thank you for being with us as well, um, of the Central Asia program at the George Washington University, one of the foremost experts on the region, who has a deep knowledge of the geopolitics, how it intersects with history and human rights, which will come together in this discussion, where we will turn to Spaska Gadzinska, our own the endowment's own deputy director for Eurasia to moderate that conversation. And I wanna offer a special thanks to Freedom Now, as well as the Central Asia program at George Washington University uh, for partnering in this, this event. Um, I think everyone here understands that Central Asia, it's a key region and a tough region huddled between Russia, China, Afghanistan, Iran, facing a multitude of challenges, the iron grip of authoritarian governments, the persistence, the corrosive persistence of kleptocracy and recurring internal unrest, as this image illustrates. More broadly, Russia's invasion of Ukraine poses an existential threat to the sovereignty of countries in Central Asia and their neighbors throughout Eurasia. And it's Ukraine's successful resistance to Russian aggression, its assertion of its independence and its identity, it stand as an inspiration so of course, many around the world, certainly here in the United States, but think about Ukraine's success in safeguarding its own freedom and identity, how that's an inspiration to the citizens and activists across Central Asia. And whether they admit it or not, Central Asian leaders realize that Ukraine's success on the battlefield and the home front was made possible by reforms, by democratization, by an engaged citizenry. So Ukraine's not only fighting for Ukraine, of course, it's defending democracies, but also across Eurasia and the potential for democracy in countries that are still authoritarian. Domestically, the citizens of Central Asia are increasingly raising their voices for democracy reform, accountability, and human rights, despite the challenges they face. Inspired by the successes of Ukrainians, the Ukrainian people, and helping to determine their own destiny, whether in 2004, 2014, by their fortitude over the past year. Civic activists in Central Asia and the broader Eurasian region, they are building ties across borders, demanding freedom and human rights and highly restricted environments, learning from each other and showing a bravery that inspires and humbles us. Civil society in Central Asia has demonstrated time and again how to overcome challenges, to identify new opportunities, and to push for greater freedom and accountability and human rights. So our speakers today will explain how activists in the region are leveraging international and domestic events to mobilize public support and to forge new paths to the democratic and free societies that their citizens seek. And for our part of the endowment, uh, we remain committed to a strong engagement with the region's civil society as it pursues its vision, its quest, its ideas for reform, accountability, and of course, above all, for democracy and freedom. So with that, let me invite Spaska to come to the stage and the panelists to join her up here on stage. Thank you very much. Spasiba, Rachmet, Raksmat, Sagbol. I hope I got that right for our panelists. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you in the Ined House. Over to you, Spaska. Thank you, Damon. Uh, we are very happy to be hosting this event. And as Damon mentioned, special thanks goes to Freedom House, without whose help we would not have been able to do this. 
not Freedom House, Freedom Now, Anthologies Met, and uh, the GW program, Central Asia program. Um, we are going to have a bit of an informal conversation as opposed to having uh, presentations by our speakers. And we would like to start with a question to Professor Peruz. Um, as we know, the war in Ukraine potentially has caused a lot of the governments in Central Asia to rethink their foreign policies and potentially seek um, greater collaboration and cooperation with the West. And the question to you, as Damon mentioned, we do focus on civil society. How can such greater cooperation with the West be used to push the Central Asian governments to encourage them to defend human rights and open up space for independent civil society and independent media? All right, thank, so thank you, Spaska. I'd like to thank the NED for, for this event, and so thank you for, for this question. Well, I mean, so uh, in this context of war, this raises, of course, plenty of, uh, of concerns around the world, but uh, this war in Ukraine raises also concerns in, uh, in all Central Asia. I mean, governments are looking for uh, alternative partners. Uh, including the West to, uh, to, to balance Russia and China. And now, uh, that being said, uh, looking at the West uh, and all the partners is, is actually not new. You know? uh, for years, all Central Asian states uh, have been trying to uh, conduct a multi-vector policy. I mean, Kazakhstan has been talking a lot about that, and other countries of Central Asia have been doing the same, even if they don't necessarily use the same terminology. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the question of influence of uh, Russia and China is not new in Central Asia. I know it's been going on for, for years. I mean, for years, we, uh, Ch well, China uh, influence has raised debates in all the region. Uh, you have some, of course, plenty of positive views about, about China. I mean, China brings jobs. China brings investments. It invests, I mean, infrastructures, industry. You have tens of thousands of Central Asian students who, are, who go to China every year and which really help them in uh, getting a job and getting a better education. On the other hand, I mean, you had plenty of... Uh, a discussion on some potential negative impacts uh, of, uh, of China uh, in the region, including an economic uh, unbalance. And uh, the fact that uh, Central Asian industry, for example, cannot necessarily compete with Chinese industry, which damages local industry. So uh, all of that, I mean, the debate on China, what I mean here is that the debate on China, I mean, it's not really new. Uh, what changes maybe with this war, I mean, I don't know if Evgeny uh, and Timur will, will agree, but uh, uh, what changes maybe uh, maybe more the image of, uh, of Russia. I mean, uh, whether we like it or not uh, so far, I mean, according to all the surveys that we had these previous years and for a long time, actually, Russia is by far, I mean, the most I would say even admired country in Central Asia by Central Asian population, much more, I mean, than, sorry, but than the US or the European Union or than, uh, or than China for plenty of re uh, reasons because, well, Russia is investing a lot in economy, uh, in human capital, and maybe thanks to migration, whatever. But today, so, I mean, it's still uh, difficult to measure the impact of this war on the image of, uh, of Russia, but I mean, just two very quick points. Uh, uh, as far as I know, we don't really have any uh, statistics, but uh, uh, Central Asian society, Central Asian populations seem to be widely divided on the, on, on the war. Uh, and this war is certainly not going to improve to help the image of, uh, of Russia. I mean, even if a part of the population of Central Asia remains favorable to, to Russia, I mean, the invasion of Ukraine and some... Russian nationalist discourse and narratives in Russia uh, obviously raise questions. And uh, on the other hand, uh, another point is that Russia was considered as a kind of guarantor of security in Central Asia, more than China, by the way, where China, I mean, in terms of military cooperation, Central Asian countries are all often very, how to say, cautious. Uh, 
But the, I mean, the incapacity which is, uh, of the Russian army, which is good news for Ukraine, good news for us, I mean, uh, to, uh, which is supposed to be one of the best armies in the world, but its incapacity to defeat a much weaker army, I mean, a raise question on the capacity of uh, Russia to uh, protect Central Asian countries if something serious re, uh, really, uh, really happens. So, I mean, again, yes, uh, this will certainly push uh, the states of the region to further uh, develop their multi-vector uh, policy. That being said, uh, I really don't think that Central Asian governments are going to, you know, jump into our arms here. Uh, the image uh, of uh, Western countries in Central Asia is not uh, excellent, to say, the, to say the least. I mean, people in Central Asia have been disappointed both by the US and uh, by, uh, by Europe uh, for different, uh, different reasons. But, uh, and you add to that, by the way, a layer, and I would say a thicker and thicker layer of disinformation produced by Russia, but also by uh, some Central Asian political circles, think tanks, media. All of that, of course, damages uh, the image of the, of the West. So, I know another point is that we need to be, I think, realistic here. Uh, Central Asia, I mean, is not a priority of the United States. It's not a priority uh, of the European Union, meaning that we cannot bring uh, significant uh, financial support to the region. Uh, so <laughs> conditioning American and European low amount investments uh, uh, with support for uh, democratic reforms will be difficult. I mean, we've been doing that for several decades. The results are not uh, great. And if we look at the uh, demo no democratization, I would say, uh, of Central Asia, this does not mean, uh, I, I don't mean that we must stop uh, conditioning our commitment with more democratization and uh, you know, with improvement of human rights. But I think that there might be some ways, uh, maybe by being more pushy when it comes to uh, the development of uh, free civil society. But I think we'll come back to that after. Um, we will definitely come back to the question of uh, what are some levers that we can use to promote civil society and reforms. But before we do that, I would like to turn to Evgeny Alexandrovich um, and have him speak a little bit more narrowly about events that happened in Central Asia in the past year. We had four violent public protests, unrest. There was also an escalation on, uh, between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan uh, on their border disputes. And in your opinion, what were the causes for some of these uh, violent protests, or they started out as peaceful protests, turned violent. What were the internal causes for them? And do you expect them to continue? Do you expect this type of public discontent to show itself in the near future? And is it possible to hope in an ideal world that this would lead to the regional governments being more responsive to the demands of its populations and more open to engaging with um, civil society on finding constructive ways to resolve the causes of such discontent. Thank I you very that. much. Uh, first of all, of course, I want to thank uh, NAD for organizing this event and uh, for the ongoing support of the civil society efforts in the Central Asia, as well as the Freedom Now, who brought us here. I think that uh, the answer is rather difficult because there is a number of factors which are in combination influencing the whole process. Uh, first of all, of course, I want to echo what uh, Sebastian said, that for many years, the whole region was uh, or looks like some black hole between big uh, countries like Russia, China, by Islamic South, with the, which is by Afghanistan and so on. And something between is Central Asia, which was not in the center of the international politics to a big extent, and it was the first problem. The second problem, or the second factor, what we're witnessing from my point of view is to a certain extent the process of the empire which is ending its existence. I am meaning Russia. It starts with the Russian empire and the, the most part of this region in 
uh, 19th century uh, was the part of this empire. Then we have the Soviet neo-empire in certain way, uh, way uh, neo-colonial uh, system. And then this uh, uh, system starts to collapse slowly uh, with the collapse of the former Soviet Union. And some of the conflicts arises of the territorial disputes of the borders which were drawn sometimes in the beginning of the 20th century, sometimes later, in a way which still leaves some kind of uh, conflicts behind the scene which exists, including Uzbek, uh, Tajik, Tajik, Kyrgyz. There is a number of issues, even Russia, Kazakhstan, with some kind of, uh, let's say so, thinking about some parts of the land which are disputed in certain historical way. This is another uh, part of the story. The third part is when we are looking at the ratings of all five countries in the regions, look for example, Freedom House ratings or uh, uh, Economist Intelligence Unit ratings. It's all countries are non-free and all countries are, looks like consolidated authoritarian regime uh, uh, and even we are speaking about Turkmenistan close to dictatorship. That's all these countries. Plus to that, all these countries are post-Soviet. They're still keeping the Soviet, Soviet institutions, the same autocratic system without communist ideology, which could not solve three key problems. Social problems, social inequality, especially after the 90s and privatization and all this process of enrichment of the uh, communist nomenclature and the list which was in power, and lack of justice, because we are dealing with a whole set of institutions, judiciary, prosecutor's offices, police, intelligence, which are keeping all this Soviet mentality, even if they were changed, in, uh, they, they, they changed generations in them, because they are replicating themselves in their habits. All this together creates all these factors altogether. They create the space for some conflicts arising, whether it is territorial, whether it is internally, like uh, the situation in Uzbekistan with this uh, Karakal Pakistan story, or social, which happens in Kazakhstan in uh, January 2022, which then, uh, let's say so, developed in some interlinked conflict altogether. And all these things reflect the same situation, that these countries being trapped between superpowers, being in a very difficult position, especially after the Russian-Ukrainian war started, and the challenges, especially to Kazakhstan, in the sense of their its sovereignty and independence, led Mr. Tokayev to maneuver even more comparatively with the multi-vector policy which, which, uh, was, which was executed by Mr. Nazarbayev. When the war starts, my first comment was that, and when we saw some shifts in the policy, I said that we have to choose between the territorial empire and the economical empire. And probably economical slightly looks better, at least it's not having some kind of uh, interest in the territory. But in general, the whole region is trapped between this Two, it is the hostage of all these processes. And they, on one hand, they have to, the leaders have to keep power and to keep safety in the sense of geopolitically. But internally, without any changes of the regimes, without any development of the institutions, they are, and being the successors of the previous elite, they have to keep some kind of secret of themselves. All this together bring the whole system uh, not legitimate to the extent that we will never have free and fair elections in the region, probably except sometime in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, the judiciary, the law enforcement are not governed by law, but governed by the system of uh, political power, very vertical. And all this together does not provide economical development, social, solution of social problems, as I already said, and the justice. That it's very difficult to say uh, how it will develop in the nearest future, but the problems are unsolved. Of course, the outcome of the war in Ukraine 
what will happen in Kremlin? What will be the, uh, let's say, so the relations between the West and China? How the unstable Islamic South will develop, in what way it will influence the situation in the region, plus internally. How the uh, Tokayev and Mirziyoyev, who are now making, uh, we call it rhetorical reforms, at least how they will uh, manage to do this, how they move forward, whether they will be able to change certain way institutions and to respond to the public demands. It will, uh, to some extent, from my point of view, it will determine the future conflicts or lack of that. Uh, thank you, Evgeny Alexandrovich. We'll get back to how civil society will respond and encourage the government to interact. Um, but before we do that, um, we would like to turn to Timur. We're thrilled to have a um, civic activist, a famous photographer and artist in his own right, who uh, runs the Gallery 139 in Tashkent. And you have found really wonderful ways to use art to foster discussions on very difficult topics in Uzbekistan. Despite the ongoing reforms there, the operating environment for civil society or public discourse remains very difficult. So we would love to hear from you. How do you use art to open up space for like-minded individuals to engage and express themselves? Thank you, Spaska. Uh, thank you, NAD, for having me here, uh, all of us. Thank you, Freedom Now, for bringing me to Washington. Uh, yeah, well, you see, the, the, uh, after this uh, dictatorship we had like for 25 years, uh, when the country was so closed uh, and the youth was leaving in mass, the country not having any no chance to express themselves properly um, and new generation grows and now we kind of are finally having at least some uh, fresh air, some space uh, for self-expression and we see the huge demand of uh, youth for the self, uh, self-expression and you know like they are right, all of them are right now on TikTok or whatever, like internet, Instagram, what all of these things. And uh, <laughs> they see how, like, how what happens in the world, right? You cannot hide it anymore. And, like uh, you have a VPN now or whatever. Like, uh, and of course you're starting to kind of uh, uh, get more interested. you kind of asking the questions and all of it. And... Uh, and the art form is like the easiest uh, the form of expression and now it's kind of become so possible like with uh, with your camera on your phone right like doing even like a simple things uh, and this also explains why we have like uh, blogging is booming uh, in Uzbekistan you have like enormous amount of bloggers right now um, and I'm really happy that in, in especially in Tashkent we started to have like a street artist lots of them and like people who like folks young folks started kind of to be less afraid on in, in doing that and and like for me and like my team it was quite obvious to you know just to uh, grant this space grant this uh, opportunity uh, to all of them you know just to, to to do that to do what they're already doing and of course the, those uh, critical questions always being raised uh, and you just back up them with your expertise like with a, some curatorial work just to navigate them a bit and and that's it and you kind of are having people coming and like and, I, and I'm really proud of what we kind of have done in three years of course in the very beginning everybody was kind of really afraid of us keeping a bit of distance you know and it took some time slowly step by step seeing that yeah, it's kind of a, it is important and, and it is cool. Now I'm kind of, a, can easily say like we're having on our events, we have like up to thousand people like are coming, even though we're like we're twice smaller than this hall, you know, <laughs> like and people are coming and just hanging out all the time and we're like creating more space for them, library, something like, you know, just uh, quite recently launched the market where the youngsters can uh, show their work, you know, sell it, make some profit for themselves. And, and, and it go, goes really cool. And this 
kind of a, through this, they kind of a, a, through the art, they uh, they finding that uh, it can be a, a unique, universal language to express yourself to to raise the questions, right? And of course, uh, uh, kind of authorities are also keeping a look at that. Of course, uh, but we're kind of a bit happy that they don't really understand the language of art yet. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, what can possibly go wrong with the art, right? <laughs> very true. And it's very exciting. What you've been able to accomplish is truly incredible. Um, and now if we can go back to Evgeny Alexandrovich and dig in a little deeper into the situation in Kazakhstan, which arguably is threatened more than other Central Asian countries by Russian aggression and a war in Ukraine. You share a long border with Russia. And you're also um, trying to deal with what happened during bloody January last year and the many deaths that resulted. What role can civil society play or has played already in trying to demand government accountability for bloody January and more broadly demand figuring out how to channel legitimate public discontent into constructive action or engagement with the government? First of all, we have to be very clear with definitions. What do we mean under the civil society? It's a very important issue because sometimes we are confusing society and civil society, but these are two different concepts. Society exists everywhere. Uh, organi civil organizations exist in Soviet Union, like veterans organizations or pensioners organizations or women organizations or children organizations. Why we are not calling it civil society? Because it lacks the word civil. It has only the last word, society. There is a lot of good organization inside the society which are dealing with the social problems, which are trying to solve them, which try to get the funds, which try to get support inside the society as such among the population. But when we are turning to the civil society, the word civil is key, that these organizations or groups or individuals who are able to raise issues, who are able to make demands to the government, who try to oppose, try to be the opponent, try to provide something, who try to speak equally with the government. This is civil society, in uh, my opinion. And sometimes I'm uh, looking, especially in last year, I'm looking at Russia, beginning of that, and see what happens with the civil society there. And I try to analyze. I'm in this field for more than 30 years. I, I'm watching in my eyes how everything developed in Russia, in post-Soviet space, how this civil society organization starts to emerge. And as it was already said, 30 years of my organization, which, which I founded in 1993. And I understand that if for many years the government is cracking down on any dissent in institutionalized form, I mean in political parties, independent trade unions, uh, mass media, and so on, then the civil society as such is not growing. It's, it's in a small number of organizations and people. And in the last probably 10, 15 years, I look at this group of organizations, at these people, at these individuals, without any political opposition in place, because there is no political participation in reality. And even the last elections in April, which were the first chance in the last probably 15 years when there was some kind of competition because they allowed 30% uh, uh, to run the elections in the so-called single mandate district. And we see some districts with 47 candidates, and some of them were in real opposition. Uh, they lost because of the elections were, as usual, uh, not fair and not free. But it looks like, again, I remember beginning of 90s when it starts flourishing, it starts developing. Then stagnation, 
and now again. Of course, uh, January events were some kind of pushing point. Yes, of course, it was clear that even in the cases in, uh, during January events and the last oil workers uh, protests in Astana and in the west of Kazakhstan shows what it is when you do not have independent trade unions. You don't know whom you could talk to, should talk to. There is no leaders. There is only people in the streets or people uh, protesting near the Kazmunai Gaz building and so on. That's, when we're looking at that, it, uh, we see how, again, this small civil society, again, starts to broaden, starts to, to enlarge itself. There is new people. You see bloggers. You see more active discussions in the social networks and more demand. Demand exists. Institutionalization of demand does not exist to the extent when it is possible to talk to the government. That's why, from my point of view, what we are doing, I think we are doing what we can. We are raising the issues, we are demanding, we are issuing uh, the reports. We are organized immediately after, the, during the general events, we uh, initiated the civic uh, human rights islands uh, on fundamental rights, on protection of fundamental rights. We're doing our job, we're documenting the events, we will produce the report in the nearest future. But at this point, it looks like it's only starting to develop. And the key problem is how this demand, these expectations of the population will be internalized and channeled in certain organized way. I am, through all my public career for 30 years, I'm moderate optimist. I use this very strange word that on one hand I'm moderate, on the other my experience show that I, uh, optimist, and on the other hand my experience show that I could be moderate. That what we are witnessing now, we are witnessing how the system again faces the problem of Soviet past, how to overcome that, how to start to reform that, and how to engage again the society to become the civil society the society to industrialize itself and express itself. The process underway, I see more and more youth involved, maybe, probably maybe not directly in politics, but in some feminist issues, in some issues of ecology, in some issues of culture, as uh, Timur said. There is starts to be the junior generation which want to be free, first of all. They are others. They have not been born in Soviet Union. They look at the world in another way. They still had not translated these uh, expectations into institutionalized form, into civil society as a big sphere. Because civil society is not NGOs. Civil society is uh, people, it's uh, individuals, it's organizations, in initiatives, it's the whole big sphere. And this sphere, hopefully, in the last couple of years, especially after the Mr. Nazarbayev uh, stepped down, and my first uh, comment on that was uh, when I was asked by the media, what do you think about uh, Mr. Nazarbayev's step down? I said that the only, that the best thing is to have two presidents instead of one. At least it is some kind of, certain kind of competition. And I think <laughs> that now we are moving forward in that regard. And this is, this is like, that, like it starts boiling. To what extent these expectations will be met, to what extent this move will be institutionalized in a certain way, we'll see, and then we could talk about to what extent civil society is influenced. At this point, of course, it's trying what it could, but again, my final point, you have to keep in mind, and I think it's for the many researchers in future and so on, to look at these 70 years of Soviet past, what it did to the social habits, to the practices, to the society as such, it was a relatively terrible result, which we now see either in Russia or in Belarus and so on. It's very important. Yes, in Central Asia, especially in Kazakhstan, it starts to be more vibrant, it starts to, to move forward, but it's very difficult to overcome this, especially when you're dealing with the same post-Soviet institutions and the same still kleptocratic system uh, with, the, with lack of communist ideology, but the very good and strong administrative command system, as it was uh, mentioned in Soviet Union. 
Thank you, Evgeny Alexandrovich. And I absolutely agree with what you're saying, but I don't want us to underestimate the degree to which over the past several years since President Nazarbayev stepped down, how much of a renaissance there has been in Kazakhstan in terms of new civic initiative, mm -hmm. new activists becoming engaged, particularly in the regions, particularly mm -hmm. among the Kazakh language population. Yeah, yes. It's been stunning to watch. Uh, my first trip to the regions was in 2014, and we had trouble finding people to work in remote regions. The latest couple of trips, we can't possibly meet the demand of all of these new initiatives. And that gives me a lot of hope for the future and for overcoming these post-Soviet uh, legacies that you are mentioning. I called it boiling. You did, yes. <laughs> Um, if we can turn to Professor Peruse now, who is keeping us honest and has reminded us that there's one country in Central Asia that doesn't get as much attention as the other ones, which is Turkmenistan, mm -hmm. given how authoritarian it is and how seemingly there's very little opportunity for civil society to exist or make a difference. And we're hoping that uh, you can provide an alternative perspective of what, the, what civil society exists there, what are opportunities for the international community to engage with it, and what could we be doing more in that context? Yeah, so, I mean, uh... Well, we are at a point where, with this war and this, uh, this difficult, this difficult situation, I mean, this gives this gives us more maybe opportunities to support uh, the development of civil society everywhere. An important point is that uh, when we talk about being engaged in civil society in Central Asia, we also have to differentiate uh, how we engage. In, you know, all the countries are different, so you could do, I mean, things. I totally agree with you, Yevgeny, that. We have to differentiate, for example, between development and a free civil society in Kazakhstan. In some countries, for example, like Turkmenistan, might be we need to be a bit less. I would say, uh, I would say, greedy. But uh, what I mean is that, uh, despite many difficulties, I think we are again yes at a time when we could be more engaged, including in Turkmenistan, in a very moderate uh, way. I mean, we know the regime of Turkmenistan. I mean, uh, the government is not going to change uh, the rules of the game. Nobody uh, in civil society in Turkmenistan and abroad believes that uh, Serdar has any intent to change to change the rules. Uh, the father, Goban Guli, Berdi Mohamedov, is still very present. He keeps control of many things. Uh, so, I mean, the priority of uh, Serdar Berdi Mohamedov, uh, who, by the way, has been, of course, very undemocratically elected, uh, will remain... Uh, uh, he will remain, and uh, his priority will to try to guarantee the regime security and uh, the new patrimonial system that this country had for so many years. On the other hand, uh, I mean, we all know, uh, I mean, for those who know Turkmenistan, uh, that this country has been facing so many uh, economic and social difficulties for a long time, but especially since uh, for almost 10 years, since uh, 2014, with the fall of hydrocarbon prices. And this country today, I mean, is even facing some food uh, security issues. And uh, so this uh, it, the difficult economic situation uh, has resulted in a high, um, in even massive unemployment. I mean, it's difficult to have statistics in this country, but it is estimated that uh, in the in the country uh, in the rural areas, uh, unemployment is uh, something like sixty percent among young population, so which is a uh, which is really high. And something which is uh, extremely concerning is that the lack of opportunities uh, in this country has led between one and two million of people leave the country out of a population of let's say estimated between five and six. So it's one third of the population. So uh, this is absolutely uh, huge. And so, I mean, this ongoing uh, economic and social crisis uh, raises concerns uh, in Turkmenistan at all levels of the society. I mean, at the top level, frankly speaking, I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't know to what extent uh, Serdar Berdi Mohamedov or his father are aware of the extent of the problems. I mean, it's type, you know, of extremely... 
uh, authoritarian regime, it's often difficult to uh, determine to what extent autocrats are aware or not on the situation, to what extent ministers or other high-level people, uh, government staff, report the situation, and uh, maybe because most of them are likely to be afraid of uh, reporting bad news. Uh, but, uh, and I specify that what I'm, I'm going to say here is based on the work and on interviews uh, I mean, something like about 30 interviews conducted with CSOs, with international organizations, government staff, outside and inside Turkmenistan that I've, uh, I've been conducting since the last three years. And what I can say uh, is that there are many concerns in the lower level of the government. Uh, and among people in the country, people are really worried. They are and they are expecting more engagement from the international community, including from the West. Uh, and by the way, uh, something interesting is that there's much less disinformation uh, in Turkmenistan than you find, for example, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Why? Because, I mean, the media, the internet, and uh, all communication means are so overly controlled that you have actually much less disinformation, meaning that uh, the West, uh, Western donors, have a, I would have a much better image than they would have probably maybe uh, in Kazakhstan or, or in Kyrgyzstan. So now that being said, uh, uh, it's not. It's not going to be easy, <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, the entry points in Turkmenistan are rare, uh, including. Uh, uh, but they are. But they exist. I mean, uh, you have some entry points at the government level. You have some entry points at the civil society level. Despite the fact that everything is so controlled by by the state. I mean, just a few examples. There, you have some opportunities to talk uh, with the government actors, including at the lower level. For example, the USC does that very well, you know, by organizing seminars. And, you know, uh, one of the big issues in Turkmenistan uh, is actually the lack of capacity, the lack of, uh, of, uh, of training of government workers. Uh, this is not specific to Turkmenistan, of course, but, the, you know, in, in this country, the purchase. And so this authoritarianism has really dissuaded most of government staff for years to take initiatives, you know, to make, uh, to, to make decisions. But, uh, I mean, implementing reforms means having government officials with skills, I mean, to carry out uh, some uh, new uh, projects, uh, some reforms. And I want to, to specify, I want to insist here that in the interviews I conducted, the lack of capacity of government staff was reported to me, not only by CSOs in Turkmenistan, but also by government staff themselves. You know, they were really worried about, uh, about, about the situation. So, I mean, uh, I understand that uh, bringing uh, capacity building may be uh, sensitive. I mean, that may be viewed as a kind of, you know, um, foreign stakeholders patronizing approach. And in a country like Turkmenistan, uh, direct criticism um, maybe should be avoided, but we, we can be a little bit inventive, you know. Uh, for example, capacity building and training programs, uh, they can be more acceptable if uh, it's presented as uh, addressing some common global challenges. For example, human trafficking uh, or the fight against uh, climate change that the government states it's, it's working on. I mean, the results are not great, but uh, it it's states it's working on. Uh, you have uh, uh, capacity building and training program also may be more acceptable in the form you just, uh, just in the form of country study visits. What I mean here, for example, is that uh, you can bring a Turkmen delegation, let's say eight or ten people, to another country, you know, to study a specific topic. Uh, that uh, and uh, the USC is doing that. And it, uh, for example, it brings some, from time to time, you know, some groups from uh, of Turkmen uh, from the Turkmen government to the to the Baltics. Uh, and, uh, and it works. So it helps them to, to open their high, to take some distance with what they, they have uh, in the country. I know actually the US government is doing that too, but maybe this might need to be a little bit more developed. And of course, I mean, uh, another point is engagement with non uh, government actors. And 
well, Turkmenistan has no independent civil, uh, civil society organizations. Uh, you have only what we could call uh, gangos. Uh, you have very few civil society actors, I mean, such as trade unions. Uh, uh, I mean, ethnic minorities organizations now are almost non-existent. I mean, faith-based organizations are very, very limited, extremely, extremely controlled. Uh, but there are also some indications of very, very small openings that could be uh, explored. I mean, you again, you have the, such a strong surveillance uh, in, uh, in Turkmenistan, but uh, in the interviews, I was really feeling how, you know, activists in local CSOs were really willing to share their concerns, their uh, expectations, and what we've seen, I mean, for it's not really new, but uh, despite the government control, despite internet restrictions, despite uh, censorship, you have a few CSOs, translation gongos, which have been able to interact uh, with foreign organizations, uh, and uh, in particularly, uh, uh, and including uh, you know, with all the cent uh, Central Asian uh, CSOs. And uh, a key issue, also for civil society in Turkmenistan is a funding. Well, that's not specific to Turkmenistan, but the difference, for example, if you compare two authoritarian countries, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan uh, is funding many, many CSOs uh, in, uh, in the country to keep control uh, on them. Turkmenistan just doesn't invest anything. Uh, it doesn't fund at all the, the, the CSOs. Meaning that, uh, and that's what I was said by many, uh, many other CSOs that we interviewed, uh, they need funds and they're really looking to the West. They're really uh, willing to have to get more funding from uh, from the West. I mean, again, it's not going to be easy. Uh, if we give funds to CSOs, you can be pretty sure that everything will be strongly controlled. But you know, I'm just trying to bring some you know tiny, tiny uh, things that we we could uh, uh, we we could uh, we could explore. I mean, and there are many uh, many sectors in which we could try to be more engaged. And again, I agree with you, Yevgeny, this is not the development of the free civil society, but we need to, 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 to find some ways, for example, uh, in, uh, in education, and we could be more, uh, you know, considering the lack of human capital in Turkmenistan now, we could be maybe more engaged in a vocational training, you know, in distance learning. Uh, what we've seen, by the way, uh, recently, you know, I mean, on that, I'm very, very uh, cautiously optimistic. Uh, Serdar Berni Mohamedov studied abroad. And uh, uh, some of the funders that I interviewed and that are engaged in, uh, in education in Turkmenistan told me that they felt a slight uh, improvement in cooperation in education, especially with more possibilities to engage in the region which they told me would, would have been impossible before Serdar. They had some requests from some local university telling them, please help us. So again, I remain cautious, but this is, uh, uh, this is something that we could, uh, we could think, uh, we could think of. There are many other, other topics. I mean, I should probably stop to, to, to talking, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, to conclude, I mean, I, I think that, uh, okay, all countries are all certain, again, but they are different, and you need, uh, for, uh, when it comes to Turkmenistan, you need to differentiate, I mean, the goals and uh, our engagement, let's say, between what you can do in Kazakhstan, what you can do in Kyrgyzstan, or even in Tajikistan, which is, which is very authoritarian, and what you can do in Turkmenistan. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor. I think it's very important to remember that we have to be nuanced in our approach in Central Asia and take into account the domestic context and tailor our engagement and support depending on what we have to work with. And in Turkmenistan, um, developing anything could probably be considered a success, but I remain mm. a little bit more skeptical. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, now, if we can go back to Timur 
And uh, Professor uh, Peruz mentioned this already about growing uh, regional collaboration and cooperation at the governmental level. But I wanted to ask you about is a similar trend about cooperation on the civil society stage already happening? And if so, what shape does it take? What areas? And is this something that should and could be encouraged to grow further? Yeah, as uh, Evgeny Alexandrovich said, uh, what is the civil society like? What, what kind of a size of it, right? Or Pick any version you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm, I have a trust for the creative industry. I believe that in the creative industry of Central Asia, there is a lot of civil society already, have, like, uh, and, uh, and it grows. Uh, and we already have... Uh, not really rapidly, but kind of a systemically growing uh, this collaboration between countries in the creative area, in the creative industry. Uh, and I, yeah, I mean, I truly believe that this is like the thing that will really uh, will support this, like a political efforts for like uh, for you know, for some collaborations between uh, countries. Um, and yeah, and you, you know the, the thing is about like a creative industry, uh, it's it still is kind of a safe zone, right? And everybody's kind of a happy about the art. Everybody happy about like you know doing the big festivals and all of this, and going like a uh, deep into uh, our like traditional art, which is kind of a, have so many similarities, like crazy in Central Asia, and. Uh, if you kind of go through it, like a work on this side, and like people are also kind of don't know much about that. They, they, they don't know, like in Uzbekistan, they don't know much about like what, what kind of art is like in Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan. So yeah, like, and, and it goes and grows. And like, I'm, I'm super happy about that. And I, I think it will bring or create also a space for this exchange of uh, civil society, like, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in like in a bigger picture. Absolutely. And I think that's one area where Turkmenistan could play a role and exactly. be engaged. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes for a Q&A session. Um, and Larissa, right over there, will come to you with the mic. So please raise your hand. And when you have the mic, please introduce yourself and any organizational affiliation you might have. Um, right here. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for such a great uh, discussion, although I was late a little, sorry for that. But that was uh, good insights about the situation, current situation in Central Asia. My name is Hadi Atullah. I'm from Tajikistan. I'm a CE fellow. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, and I did a little research about uh, one of the questions, and I was wondering, what, uh, what do you think about the following? How come countries with a similar background uh, can have diff different political regimes? If we just compare Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, they have uh, had different, uh, same political background. They have been uh, in the same political regimes as we know, Soviet Union, but uh, in the current situation, in the modern times, they, in Kyrgyzstan there is a little movement towards democracy, but still uh, after Japarov it, it has been <laughs> stopped a little, but uh, still there is a little of uh, freedom of speech and uh, all this uh, in points of uh, democracy. And the same happens with uh, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan and uh, Kazakhstan and also Uzbekistan. How come that all countries are from the same region, from the same political regime, can have different regimes in the, in the modern times? Thank you. Does anyone want to take a stab at an answer? <laughs> I could start. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Uh, uh, first of all, I w add to that that there is the regime in Ukraine and Georgia, and then in Russia and Belarus. All of them are coming from the Soviet Union. I think there is a lot of uh, different factors which influence that. First of all, uh, all these countries 
probably, uh, maybe including Belarusia, but probably to some extent Belarusia is similar, uh, were undergoing uh, transition from the state-owned economy of Soviet type without private property. You remember that there was no private property in Soviet Union. So the market economy was private property. And in all these countries, it was started by the same post-communist or communist elites who became the key beneficiaries of this process. And then each of them have to protect these results of the, this transition. And this protection determined, or the way of protection, determined how each regime, what instruments, and what structures, and what, uh, let's say, so sources and resources they try to rely to consolidate the power and to protect this, uh, this uh, property and this uh, power which was linked to the, to, the, to the wealth. As a result, in, uh, and, and it depends to a certain extent on the structure of each society, different structures. Monomadic culture, another one structure in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, another in Turkmenistan where the uh, Turkmen Bashi the first uh, decided to consolidate the power on the personal cult, which is much more difficult to do in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. In Tajikistan, civil war and all related issues influenced in another way. And then each of these regimes, or uh, in uh, Belarus, Mr. Lukashenko came on the, under the slogan of fighting corruption and then decided to, to a certain extent, to make the system looking like Soviet or socialistic, and he is the guarantor of the, some kind of su such type of economy. That's all this transition was done by these ruling elites to certain, with, with the same starting point, but the, in the different way of using instruments to control the power and consolidate the power. Where it is going in another direction, where the change of elite took place. Starting with the, of course, uh, we could say Baltic states were under the Soviet rule much less than all others, but still, immediately, in all these three Baltic states, the elites were changed into with the nationalistic or national identical uh, slogans. Communist elite was thrown away, and they immediately turned in another direction. In the post-Soviet space, some countries, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, has natural resources, which provide them another sources of so-called legitimacy economically and so on, and another type of regime developing. That Kazakhstan, having these uh, opportunities, it's moved in a certain kind of, let's say so, soft authoritarian way, such kind of more or less trying to provide some space for uh, opposition, for independent voices, and so on. But uh, uh, in, in the years, they came to the same, tried to eliminate all political opposition, independent media, but not in such harsh way like Karimov or, or in Turkmenistan. In other countries, Kyrgyzstan was the country without such resources, with the uh, economical problems, and then with the high uh, level of criminality involved in some kind of sharing power, and this uh, and interlead struggle, we, in, in, and there was some kind of change of the uh, leaders, but not the change of the elite. A certain kind of some groups were uh, some elites coming to power within the same uh, uh, level of the elite. That this is the differences, mostly uh, from my point of view, mostly uh, determined by this transition period. Some personalities and some cultural or uh, structural. Uh, differences and specificities. Thank you. Um, Rudy Porter was next. Thank you. Uh, Rudy Porter, I'm from the Solidarity Center. Uh, you made brief uh, mention of the effects of the war in Ukraine. We read reports of migrant workers from Central Asia in Russia being offered incentives to enlist and fight. 
And of course, then some return uh, injured and some return in body bags. How, how well is that reported? And what is, if any, is the effect of that in Central Asia? Uh, I mean, I don't... Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. no, okay. I don't know, I mean, uh, to what extent that's reported, but I think that in Central Asia, I mean, at least in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, or Uzbekistan, people are aware of that because, uh, first, I mean, uh, you have the... Uh, all social networks, and you have so many migrants, you know, in uh, in uh, in Russia who still uh, communicate with uh, with their family. So uh, it's uh, I think it's uh, reported, not in the media. I don't think so. I mean, uh, probably they don't talk much about about it. But uh, I think that central. I know that, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, there are some more and more discussions, resentment in the population because they know that some of their, uh, I mean, pe people have some of their members of their family so were sent to Ukraine and, as you said, brought back in a, in a, body, in a body bag. So this is, uh, this is creating some, uh, I would say, increasing, uh, increasing re resentment. And I really do believe that people in Central Asia are aware of that. You know. mm -hmm. um. Sorry, Nava Hora was next. Right there. Thank you so much. Nava from The Voice of America. Evgeny, if you could uh, elaborate on uh, what you said earlier as uh, what you defined as rhetorical reforms by Mirziyoyev and Takayev. Uh, Timur, I would also be, I'm also incredibly curious about how you see the reform process in Uzbekistan. The country has a new constitution now, right, as of uh, Monday. And uh, another question to all of you. Um, we keep on hearing from the U.S. government that they are excited about the new generation uh, in these countries, meaning that new generation, new mentality, new political mentality in the government, um, which in the region doesn't necessarily show, uh, at least based on my own analysis. Yeah, there is a new generation by age, but not necessarily in the political mentality. So if you could also speak on that, the changing mentality in uh, changing approaches in the civil society as well as um, in the government. So thank you. Okay, probably I will start. Uh, look, uh, if we, Look back to Mr. Nazarbayev. Mr. Nazarbayev starts with the, at certain point, he starts with the program of the reforms 2030. Then he decided that it's not so big period. He imposed the program 2050. Probably then will be 2100, but then he resigned and we don't know. But speaking seriously, uh, Mr. Tokayev, has clear challenge about the reforms because if he really want to reform the system, he should do what I said. He needs to get rid of the Soviet system, Soviet institutions, especially, especially the so-called four structures. I mean, in general, uh, prosecutors' offices, judiciary, law enforcement, and intelligence. And it is the most difficult thing to do. And we see it even in the countries which are trying to do it uh, well in the post-Soviet space, where I mean in Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. But he is in a much more difficult position now because he has these uh, geopolitical challenges related to the war in Ukraine, plus relations with West China and so on around, plus uh, the problems internally with the, he do not have enough strength among the elites. Uh, he tried to consolidate power uh, in different ways through the uh, notion that he get rid of Nazarbayev in certain ways, it's one. Secondly, he's the guarantor of the sovereignty and trying to maneuver between the superpowers and so on. That he's declaring that he needs the reforms. But in reality, he's afraid of moving to forward to not destabilize the system as he see it. And thus, the reforms 
are coming to the idea of modernizing slightly the system to make it slightly more effective, to restructurize it. But I'm absolutely sure, as an economist, as a lawyer, as a public figure for, for more than 30 years, that unless you will not make serious reforms, reform these institutions, whenever you are doing so the opening of the political space or liberalization on any other way, it's very difficult to expect any breakthrough. And you could not meet the public demands in that regard. Because this system in this way is ineffective. Again, it's partly soft Soviet system with the market economy and the private property, and that's all. That's why I called it, it's not mine, it's Matthew Schaff. It is his, his <laughs> the author. I don't want, I keep his intellectual property on that. <laughs> that Copyright. <laughs> that. About the rhetorical reform. When, but, but I think that it is very, very absolutely right word. We could use the word uh, politological word imitation democracy, but it is the efforts to try to do some reforms, not touching upon, upon the basics. I don't know to what extent, I, I, uh, after he declared these reforms uh, one year ago, I said that either you will do it or the reforms will pull you behind uh, themselves. You have to do it. It's very difficult to do, I understand. He have not so uh, big team. And then exactly the, uh, the answer on your second question. The, yes, there is certain kind of generational change. But the problem is, again, that the institutions are replicating themselves. And the new generation coming to the same institutions starts to learn the same rules of the game to a certain extent. And even those who are under the Bolashak program, who are coming back, studying in the Western universities in the US, in the UK, in Germany, in France, somewhere else, they are coming back and they are either not going to the public service and trying to, 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 to have the places in the companies and so on, or to leave the country. And those who are coming to the public service, they start to follow the rules, unfortunately, because the system is so deeply rooted it is 70 years plus, and the problem is even more, when we're talking about kleptocracy and all that, it is commercialized, which was not in the Soviet times. It's heavily co commercialized. And this is, this altogether creates serious problems to him. Yes, probably he thinks he's the person with the good education and this type is looking for what. He and this probably he understands it to the extent we are talking about, for sure, but the problem is how to move in that direction. It is, of course, it's frightening him because he, he did not want to destabilize and he did not even have such kind of strength in that regard. It's very difficult having especially the Russian-Ukrainian war as a certain kind of threat to sovereignty and independence. Yeah, um, uh, Nabahor, thank you for, for your question. And you're doing this journalist work even here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so and, uh, I will start with the referendum question. Um, and I'm, I'm, I was here already when the referendum happened, and I didn't vote. Uh, I have, I will, I will explain. <laughs> so I will open, I, I open up the Instagram in the morning, having this little jet lag, and I see like everybody now is you have the statuses on the Instagram, and everybody's there. No, 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 no. Uh, and if, it, it, I do understand everyone uh, who was uh, putting this no because our generation, my generation. Uh, never had like you know the, this practice of trust to the government, and uh, like we never experienced that uh, they try to talk to us, to understand us, to kind of a, you know to just to be on our side ever. So why why why, why we can't even participate in that? You know, like where what are the reasons? And this uh, you know, constitution being changed fifteen times. Nobody cares. <laughs> and, like, and this is what I'm kind of seeing in my community, my generation. We're like, eh, we don't like, we don't, we don't, we don't. what do you can do about that? Nothing. And like, why should we kind of uh, to participate or whatever? So um, it's not for us, you know? <laughs> and uh, talking about the reforms, well, again, uh, I, I can't say that I really feel them much on myself. 
well, yes, they're happening. Yes, something on the background, people talking about that, like everybody's talking about that. We see a lot of foreigners are coming and talking about that. Uh, we see like in the news that, yeah, there are reforms. <laughs> There's the like, woof, news Pakistan. Hey, uh, and we're like, mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, all right, cool, yes, <laughs> reforms. And again, our generation stays indifferent to that. Like, we, 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 we don't see it, we don't feel it, we don't, we'll, just we don't really understand that, you know, much. And nobody ever, ever tried to kind of, uh, you know, to, to, to talk to us about that, to, you know, to explain. And maybe there are really cool things that are happening, but we would love to know about them. <laughs> Yeah, but we don't know. Thank you. Um, if we can take like two questions at a time, Larissa, there there was one right there, and there's one behind Aaron, and then we'll get to these. Um, turn around, Larissa, right there. And then we'll get to Kathy, and you're right there. Yeah, Mirgo Kuhn, Sairai, thanks a lot for all of the discussion that's taking place here. One question which can unfold into a longer question. It is very hard, and Evgeny uh, Alexandrovich, you highlighted uh, the dark space, right? The dark uh, hole. <laughs> it is very hard to see any sunshine through, through the darkness. But we know the cracks are there. We see it every single time we travel. We see it through the work with our local partners. And I guess my intention here is to put even more emphasis on those cracks so they can widen, right, and be creative about it as well. Yes, not all of the questions can be tested today, but they can be tested tomorrow. But all should, I guess, round itself around positive branding. It is very hard to brand something positively when the space is opening, when there is so much negativity, right, that when things are not going well. So from Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan perspective, if there was one thing that you want to turn into a positive brand for that opening, what could that be? And one more question on that side as well. Right there. Thank you. My name is Katerina Darchenko. I'm originally from Ukraine, uh, but when war started, um, we as like political management team work with uh, Kazakh's opposition. And, um, you know, I see a um, situation when people like from new, new generation who try to register political force, they just not register, no, as you know. And secondly, when the same people trying to be like majoritarian, also elect from district, they just take off from elections because like they have some problems in their documents. And, um, you know, after these elections, when we see that uh, like these protocols, like result of elections was wrote before elections, um, I see that some people disappointed and maybe in future they don't want to take in part in political process because like all unfair, because like, uh, no, you know, they haven't success now. So my question to you as scientists um, and uh, no opinion leaders in region, how to form institutions to build this no you know believing in future and to form institutions for really new political forces which with no new brand but with new you know thinking and uh, keep uh, these people who have you know position and who want to change Kazakhstan and, uh, you know, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan in future to keep uh, this passion for change? Or it's not possible like now because still it's, you know, authoritarian regime. Thank you. We could start with Mirko's question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, First of all, uh, about positive brand or something positive. for me, it's easy to answer. I was born in Soviet Union. And I don't see any positive until 1985, and unexpectedly, everything became positive for some time. So that's uh, something so we are waiting for something that it will happen. I see certain kind of openness because, as I said already, after a short period of more or less free and fair elections, 
a number of positional political parties which exist in the beginning of the 90s. I was one of the founders of the first oppositional party in Kazakhstan. The uh, independent media, which exist, one third of the parliament in 1993 in Kazakhstan was opposition. Democra it was Democratic Kazakhstan faction in, in the parliament. That's, uh, then it was 1995, the system became more and more and more consolidated, more and more authoritarian. And after uh, 2019, you have seen after the, the, even the elections of the president in 2008 shows that there is some kind of demand for the change. And even if Mr. Takai won, it was a certain kind of competition, even if there was a lot of uh, rigged election, as usual. That's, I think that now the, I see this positive trend. Now something again starts to change. And what is, impo uh, what is impossible to see in, uh, I don't know, in 2015, in 2005, and so on, we saw uh, this year. We saw this uh, new generation of uh, young uh, uh, people with ambitions, which uh, are trying to run the elections. They lost, they failed, they have, but they have their group of supporters, they have the independent observers, and so on. And, but we have to look at the previous period of time. We have the proportional system, but closed party list. People don't know whom they are voting by. They don't go for the voting, and the turnout was what was written in the protocol, not in the, in the practice. I think that we see some positive change, in even in the re, uh, reintroducing the constitutional court, for example, or changing something. Yes, it's small pieces. Yes, it's still the part of the same uh, political authoritarian system. But I used to uh, find three strategy. Of, of my work. Number one is presumption of political will. And then you're trying to intervene and do all the best to make these systemic changes possible. Number two, harm reduction. At least to make things not so worse as uh, they could be. And finally, to work for future. And now what we're doing, we're working for future. We're preparing uh, draft laws. We're training the, I'm, uh, every month I'm training young, uh, uh, human rights defenders, I have the third generation in my organization and so on. That's, this is not the question how, uh, it, it will, how, how the whole political context will develop. Now, if we will push for the registration of political parties, opposition political uh, that, that were denied, this is what we have to focus on. I said that for the, uh, the first day when we will see the opposition in the parliament will be the last day when the people will be arrested in the streets. That's, there is something to, to work through. I don't think that those who take part in the elections, they will give up. I don't think so. Many of them will still move on. They will decide. Some probably will give up. But there is a new generation of uh, young politicians who are interested, uh, like uh, jean Bart Mamai or his wife, or some others. They already have the taste of this competition. They are they're angry that they lose. That this is... Potential, but the problem is, what will be with this space? If it will be again be limited, yes, of course, it will be uh, again some kind of let's uh, uh, say failure. And finally, look at the results even of these elections: thirty percent, twenty-nine seats, huge territory for each district. The people whom population didn't know well, they have. If you look at the normal sociological or politological analysis, they gained impossible support. Impossible, even if they lost. We'll see how it will develop. But of course, again, we're turning back. How the reforms will go on, whether uh, these reforms will be real and not and not rhetorical, and then we could uh, talk about the possibilities and positive change for sure. Right. So, uh, last two questions, Larissa, Kathy Cosman in the back, and this woman right here. Sorry, we're running out of time, so last two questions. I wish we weren't running out of time. It's been an absolutely great session, and I'm particularly thrilled to hear some in-depth uh, discussion of Turkmenistan, which is usually just ignored. Um, uh, 
And apropos of that, I wanted to ask about um, diaspora communities, uh, which are particularly important in the case of, of Turkmenistan for Iran and Afghanistan, um, but also perhaps, you know, in, in other ways in other countries and what, you know, what might be helpful in that respect or not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Larissa, right there. Matt, did you have a question? Sure. Uh, this woman right here. Raise your hand, please. There we go. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Zulfia from Azerbaijan, and I'm a civic activist uh, there, and I will be here uh, working in NDI by July. Uh, first of all, I'm not uh, well aware about the region, but for me it was very interesting to hear. And uh, specifically, I had a flashback about um, what Mr. Sebastian uh, mentioned uh, about Turkmenistan, that um, in Turkmenistan, there was a, a huge economic crisis, and then, uh, like this, uh, after having this oil and these resources, they started to have power, and uh, auto, uh, like let's say dictatorship, like uh, happened. And uh, for me, it was like flashback for myself, like for my country, because uh, in Azerbaijan we had like uh, just uh, when the like uh, Soviet Union collapsed and. Um, like um, we started to have like war in Karabakh and then there was huge crisis on IDPs and everything and like the country was so weak but then the country went got uh, a lot of resources and oil and this money and it started to get its uh, power and uh, now like um, let's say when I turn back to the region like in Caucasus I see like Armenia and Georgia when they have like more or less democracy and this uh, like political space while we don't have it like because uh, just government basically doesn't depend Depend on us. It uh, doesn't uh, like our voice is not important because it has oil, it has power. So for me, it's very interesting to hear your positions. Like, um, what do you think uh, in such countries, like where there is no, as you mentioned, the space where uh, like uh, leaders can grow? You know, when there is no space, like as you mentioned, uh, there were like activism and uh, protests, but there were not leaders. So how, which kind of events actually in these kind of countries where there was a past dictatorship or like authoritarian, uh, auto authoritarianism, uh, how it can change? Because like we don't have space to grow such leaders. We don't have space, you know, for for uh, people to impact uh, a huge amount of number of people. So how do you think in your perspective in such countries we can bring change? Well, in a way, you know, I, I think that I would uh, collect the two questions because, <laughs> you know, thank you, Katie, for mentioning uh, the, the role the, of the diaspora because it's particularly important for, for Turkmenistan. As I was saying, we, again, we don't know exactly how many people left this country, but we have at least one million of people, which is absolutely huge. And uh, they are very important because all these people, you know, they work in Turkey, they work in, mostly in Turkey and in Russia, but uh, they have a job. Uh, but most of them, they want to go back to, uh, to Turkmenistan. You know, they left just because they had, they had the feeling that they had no future, no perspective, or they just couldn't find a job and so on. But all these people, yeah, they, they want to go back. And this is where... Uh, the international communities, the United States and the uh, foreign donors, we will really need to be, I think, more in catch with them. Uh, first, be, be, because they're going to be the future of the human capital. And this is where, I, for me, I mean, the main change, my, I, I, for me, it's very difficult to imagine how the system in Turkmenistan is going to change. You, know, you have some countries like North Korea which have been going on like that for, for decades. So I'm not saying that uh, uh, could, uh, Turkmenistan is going to... Uh, I'm saying, sorry, that Turkmenistan could remain as it is. But my uh, op more optimistic point would, is probably uh, mostly with the diaspora. Because again, we can, uh, we can be more engaged with them. I mean, one or two million people abroad, I'm not saying that we can be engaged with all of them, we, but we can be engaged with many of them by you know, helping them in terms of education, in terms of vocational training, everything which is going to help uh, the, the, the future of the country when these people will, will go back. Uh, you, we can also interact with them in terms of human rights, much more than we can, what we can do uh, in the country. Although here, we also have to be very careful when we 
uh, when it comes to Turkmen, uh, with, with the Turkmen diaspora, because we have to be aware that the Turkmen diaspora is very strictly monitored by the security services of Turkmenistan. So mm -hmm. any uh, activities uh, trying to engage the Turkmen diaspora in human rights, civil society, politics, and so on, we have to be careful. But still, if we are, if we are careful, we can do things. And another point here is that you also have uh, several uh, civil society organizations created by, by Turkmen who are extremely active. And for years, they've been telling me, we need more help for foreign interners because we need more help, uh, of course, funds, but also we need training. We, we, we lack capacity. So uh, again, the diaspora can, could play a big role. I don't have a solution on how to change the, the, the system in Turkmenistan. I'm not very optimistic, but... Uh, my only optimistic point would be with the, one of my optimistic point would be with the diaspora. Yes. I would also add, include them in art projects. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're right on time. I would just wanted to extend uh, thanks to our panelists. This was a very important and very timely discussion. Thank you for taking the time, and thank you to our audience for these meaningful and smart questions. So. Thank you. Thank you.